Hi again, everybody. This is Gemini Rising um, from Ina Dow, uh, presenting another episode of um, Art History, the Female Perspective, um, a sponsor built on the NEAR protocol is what Ina Dow was built on. So um, let's get started. Today, we're going to talk about uh, an artist called Zana Brisky. <clears throat> <clears throat> she was born in 1966 um, in the UK and studied literature at Cambridge and then photography uh, and then in New York and um, has traveled all over the world um, as a documentary photographer. And she's noted for her immersive approach within um, the documented communities that she spends a lot of time with. Um, in, 19, in the 1990s, she started a project in um, India, uh, where she, uh, in the Kolkata's red light district, where she started taking photographs of sex workers' children, and then <clears throat> started working with them to empower them and give them some kind of voice. Um, she started a project um, that kind of blossomed all over the world where she was giving children uh, the empowerment by artistic means, and in this case, using photography. Um, this led into uh, a documentary film she ended up making called Born in the Brothels, Born into the Brothels. Um, it was directed, uh, co-directed with Ross, Ross, sorry, Ross Kaufman. And as you can see in 19, in 2005, it won an Academy Award for Best Documentary Feature. Um, it, because of the uh, success of this film, she founded a, um, organization called Kids with Cameras um, to, uh, and focusing on art and education as a transformative tool for the um, underprivileged uh, children of the world. Um, in uh, 2002, she shifted her um, focus onto wildlife photography again uh, emphasizing on environmental conservation and the beauty of nature. Um, she's very much an advocate for uh, the underprivileged and also the animals, um, endangered animals of the world. Uh, this one is a photograph of a gorilla, um, a mountain gorilla in Rwanda. And I just wanna say that I was lucky enough I didn't go to Rwanda, but I went to the same mountain range in um, uh, the Eastern Congo, um, the um, mountains of the moon. And I actually saw those gorillas for myself. And that was one of the most uh, amazing experiences I've had in my life. So um, there is um, the mountain gorilla. Uh, that she photographed in 2002. Um, again, uh, focusing on endangered species. Uh, this one is um, uh, an image of a flying fox. It's very dramatic. It's very, very uh, dark and um, uh, foreboding in a way. It almost looks like one of those Batman symbols. Um, but uh, again, I think that the sort of forebodingness reflects on her desire to um, bring into focus endangered animals around the world. The next image is also of flying foxes, but this is a swarm um, of them, not just one. Uh, it's it's very densely covered, very speckled. Um, you have to um, realize that these images are quite large and further on I will show you how large they are. So it's probably a lot easier to pick out things 
than just seeing it on the screen here. Um, this was taken in Australia and um, I think her images are extremely beautiful. Um, this one here is called Arabian Horse in Namibia, in the desert of Namibia. Um, the, you can see the sand dunes in front kind of gently rippling, um, but you cannot see over the horizon. You can see a peak of something, what could be to come, but you cannot see um, any further. And it kind of gives you the impression of vastness just because you can't see any further than, you know, a couple of hundred yards or so, I would think. Um, the next image is of a giraffe in South Africa. <clears throat> Again, she's using these monochrome um, in, uh, technique, no color, just this one lonely giraffe against this very dark uh, foreboding background. Um, but it stands out because it is so uh, much lighter than the rest of the image. And again, like I said, these are very large images. Um, so I imagine that that giraffe would probably be a bit more noticeable in the larger images when you would see this in real life. Um, this is humpback whales uh, mating group uh, underwater, obviously, in the Pacific Ocean. Um, you could just see kind of their outlines and uh, their, you know, you can really see their pectoral fins. Um, but it's, you know, it's very dreamlike in a lot of ways. Um, it kind of, that grainy texture kind of adds a um, timeless quality to the image itself. Another humpback whale, um, a close up. Uh, you can really see the patterns on the whale itself. And I just can only imagine how amazing these would look in real life. Um, like I said, I will show you shortly. Um, these are very large images. Here is an image of an African elephant. Um, very, very imposing because it's all kind of constrained close up, but you can see how big those tusks are. Um, <coughs> again, a very, um, another endangered species for those tusks. As you probably know, um, old pianos, their keys were made from their ivory tusks and, you know, a lot of carvings and things like that, um, which basically kills the elephant. So um, again, another uh, image to bring to light the um, problems we have in the world and the uh, endangered species because of these problems. A leopard in Botswana. I think this one's pretty cool because you can see the the curvature of the earth for all of you out there who believe in the flat earth theory. Um, well, it doesn't look that flat to me. Um, the, the leopard really stands out, although you can see how it blends in, if you can understand what I mean, because of the way the spots are arranged that you wouldn't really notice them if you were uh, one of their prey. These are the geladas. They're a type of baboon. Um, <clears throat> their <laughs> expressions are pretty funny. It actually reminds me of the the three monkeys, the see no evil, hear no evil, speak no evil, even though they're not covering their um, eyes 
ears and mouth. Uh, it still kind of reminds me of that. Um, these are uh, shaggy monkeys that live in Ethiopia. Um, and again, in a lot of ways, the fact that they're black and white and extremely large really um, brings out the textures and the kind of emotion and feelings of these photographs. Here's another troop um, of galadas um, in Ethiopia again. Uh, it kind of portrays the idea of movement. Uh, obviously, they're going somewhere. Um, yeah, uh, pretty impressive. The great white pelican is about to take off, spread out, uh, wings spread out over the water. A really, really um, interesting capture. It isn't still in the water, but you can see it's going somewhere. Um, everything around it is pretty hazy um, and kind of unknown. Um, very, very uh, full of emotion, I would say. It, it, it's um, You can see the slight ripples in the water. Um, but it's kind of like very intimate as well because you don't see anything else except for this pelican. Here we have a lion in Zambia. Um, when I was in Africa, I also saw a lot of the animals we just looked at. Uh, and I have to say lions, male lions are pretty lazy. Um, this is what they do most of the time. Uh, the women, the female lions go out and hunt and the male lions wait at home for their food to be delivered <laughs> by their wife. Uh, kind of the opposite of what we believe human society should be where the men go out and hunt and bring home the food. Uh, all right, so here we have the polar bear in the Arctic uh, 2015. It's kind of a reflection of what is happening there uh, with the um, ice caps melting and um, the indigenous species of that area um, having a harder and harder time surviving. Um, it's walking away on this flow, but it doesn't really have anywhere to go to, as you can see in this picture. And it really kind of brings in the um, showing you the plight of these animals and their struggle to survive. <clears throat> and like I was saying before, here is a photograph of the photograph. And you can actually see how large um, these are, uh, these photographs are. Um, they're, you know, printed on, with silver, um, and a very high quality Japanese paper, <clears throat> very rough around the edges in keeping with the idea that nature is rough around the edges as well. Here are some more pictures of straw colored fruit bats of Zambia. Um, a massive swarm of them flying through the air. You can see the, you know, little uh, sun and the background very far away. Everything's dark, um, but it has a lot of movement. It's it's very very um, dreamlike in a way. Uh, if you were to dream in black and white, I guess uh, she does choose only black and white for her images. So far, anyway. And this sort of last nature wildlife photograph is a uh, eastern gray kangaroo. 
um, from behind. Um, you can see the sunlight through the branches. You can see all of the nature surrounding it. Um, but again, it feels really intimate. Uh, the kangaroo is looking back at us and um, you kind of feel like you're part of the image, part of that nature. And I think that's one of her uh, great attributes is you're all, you always feel when you're looking at these images that you are part of them, that you are in them. Um, they're very intimate, like I said. Well, all through that, um, or after that, she started um, a new technique called animal grams, um, based on photogram, photograms. And this, you know, a photogram is basically taking light sensitive paper, putting something on top of it, exposing it to the light, and then you just kind of get an outline of um, the thing. I mean, people usually do with flowers and leaves and branches and things. I don't really think I've seen many people doing this with animals. Um, and it's quite interesting because what she does is she goes out in a, on a moonless night with her light sensitive paper and um, then kind of does a flash with her flashlight and captures the life-size impression um, on on the paper. So she's kind of holding the paper up. Um, I guess in this case, these uh, praying mantises would have been sitting on the paper, um, exposing them to the light. And then, now this is already pretty difficult to do with insects. Uh, she got, um, this is a bark Katie did. She did the same thing. Um, with this, uh, I imagine that it would have been placed on the paper and then the light shone, shone, shone shined <laughs> anyway, um, uh, onto it for a few seconds. And, um, you know, she would take those into the um, dark room and develop them or have them developed, I guess. Another one, a cicada. I really, really like the way the wings are transparent, but you can still see the markings, um, even though um, you can see the veins and the markings of the cicada. If you don't know what a cicada is, uh, <laughs> you'll probably recognize the sound at nighttime, usually in more tropical climates, obviously. I guess up here we would have crickets up in North America, um, but in the jungles and uh, tropical areas, they would have cicadas. Another one that I think would probably be a little bit more difficult to do because you can kind of see that these are flying. Uh, I, I mean, it would take her hours and hours just waiting for something to come along that she could, you know, that would come across her her um, light sensitive uh, paper that she could flash a light on and capture capture this moment in the life of these animals. I think the whole um, uh, concept is really quite interesting. Uh, so you have the red dragonfly. Uh, we will have to take her word for it that it's red. Um, and the lunar moth, uh, both kind of flying across this paper, um, light sensitive paper, almost like a ghost. Same thing with these guys. The Eastern Newt, it's called a diptych because there are actually two images. Um, it says Eastern Newts and Spider, and I have looked and looked, and I cannot for the life of me figure out where the spider is. Um, maybe somebody can tell me if you are watching this, write it in the comments because I have searched this image and I cannot find any spider. Same thing with this one here. Um, I see the leaves. Uh, I see the newts, but I don't see a spider. 
unless maybe there's a spider sort of in that middle leaf. And, and I mean, that line going through could be a spider web. I don't know. Um, it just kind of highlights the interaction between these creatures and nature in a very different and interesting way. So if you thought it would be difficult to capture these kind of creatures, she then moves on to capturing wildlife, actually, where she would wait for hours. She would have this paper set up. There would be no light, no moon, no nothing, and wait for hours to have some kind of animal walk past her piece of uh, light sensitive paper for her to shine a light on and capture their coming through that. This is a civet. Um, a civet is a uh, from the cat feline family. It's a, it's a wild cat um, from Borneo, is one of its habitats. Um, kind of in mid stride, uh, very, very uh, dreamlike, you know, especially in the actual body of the civet, those little dots. And um, it's just a really interesting technique. And then she went on to move on to bears, bear o gram bear o -grams, uh, She was in the forests of uh, upper New York and waited out there for the bears to walk by. Um, the next few ones will be various bears. Um, like I said, this would have taken her a very, very long time and a lot of patience. I mean, wildlife photographers have to have a lot of patience anyway, because they um, have to wait for the perfect moment to take these photographs or even videographers um, to have a large, I mean, that's got to be a pretty large sheet of paper to have that bear fit on there and then have it up there waiting uh, for it to walk by is very interesting. Um, I just love these images. Another, like I said, there's a lot of, um, she did a lot of bear ones. Uh, and as you can see, as time went on, she got better at it. Um, I don't know if she got better at developing these images or, um, you know, what, uh, but, you know, it's a profile. You can see the fur on it. Um, you can see the fern would actually be a, in front of it as it sort of overlaps with its nose um, and the fern. Uh, but really, really interesting technique. Another one um, filled with vegetation in the foreground and it's just amazing the the details of the fur the you know you can really see these outlines i mean i never in my life would have thought of the idea of actually taking the idea of a photograph and getting these large sheets of 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 um, light sensitive paper and waiting out in the forest for a bear to walk past it so that you could shine a light is, is just uh, incredible. Another one, this one, the bear is kind of reaching up, standing up. Obviously there must be something pretty good to eat up there. Um, that's usually what bears like to do is um, eat. <laughs> that's their main purpose in life, I think, is, is uh, eating. Uh, Yes, another bear in the New York forest. Um, looks like it's sort of lying down for a while there. Maybe that would have been easier to get, but how do you know wherever you, I mean, it's not like she can find a bear, run out, put the paper behind it and then come back and make the photograph. She would have had to have had the paper there and then she would have had to waited and hoped that something would come across. 
um, the photograph. So um, that's a lot of patience and a lot of work. These last two images of, of, are of a raccoon. Um, very interesting the way that wood kind of encircles the raccoon. Uh, and it doesn't, actually, when you look at it in a lot of ways, it kind of reminds you of the silhouette of the bear, other than the pointy ears. Um, here's another raccoon um, in mid-stride. Uh, pretty, uh, you know, capturing the motion of it. Uh, and again, the details on the edges of the fur. Very beautiful. So that's um, Zana Briski. Uh, she's a, an amazing storyteller um, with very sort of intimate pictures that she takes. I think all of her photographs are very intimate and empathetic. She kind of places herself there. She immerses herself in the situation, whether it was the children of um, impoverished nations that she was uh, trying to uh, prop up by um, starting these programs, um, sort of artistic programs and educational programs to maybe bring them out of their poverty uh, to the um, relationship she has with animals and wildlife. And um, uh, she kind of has a lot of artistic innovation but in a documentary style, she's documenting something. Um, obviously her career uh, reflects her commitment to social causes and artistic, uh, the artistic portrayal of life um, in general. So from a documentary photographer to wildlife photogram innovations, um, I'm really looking forward to what else she has to say by using her photography for storytelling and education and advocacy. And that is the brief story of Zana Briski. Um, I, like I said, pretty amazing work, um, starting off by winning an Oscar and continuing on. Um, so yes, um, thank you for watching and thank you, um, uh, uh, near foundation and, and, um, the creatives Dow for funding these projects. And I hope you have a great day. Thank you.